Z. Twitter's been going around for several minutes now. Go ahead, I think we've got one more sounding here about what was going on. This is like John Davies did this for me years ago. We kind of see um, you know, lots of cake come across there and we have the boundary. But you know, once again, you know, there was there's positive shear here. This is, you know, the rough thought it was going on at the time. It probably wasn't off by too much. But you know, these winds usually don't get the chase to be all that excited. Yet we had a significant tornado event with this day. So you know, tend to keep an eye on boundaries, big K, positive shear can 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 do the trick. Uh, Kiowa County, uh, May 25th, this is the second of the third big days. We had 15 tornadoes in southeast Colorado with these events, 13 moved with this storm. The first one occurred relatively early, 2131 Z, and that's what occurred at, you know, prior to 6 p.m. 18 Z is noon, 0 Z is 6 p.m. during the summer. A lot of this work I'm going to show came from uh, Monterey and others. Um, Mike Umshide and uh, Evan Bookbinder, I believe, wrote a paper for SLS and discussed this case in detail. So you kind of see there, this is, you know, not, 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 not too shabby, you sit and watch. Watching what's going on there, two tornadoes, two going around each other. Eventually, this developed into a supercell tornado uh, later on in the, in, the, in the afternoon. Here's some data at 12Z, what was going on. Once again, you know, not all that exciting. It, it is a pretty modest flow there, but once again, if we drop up to the west, here's your observed sounding from both Dodge City. Once again, you know, those winds, you know, typically don't really get you all that excited. There's some shear there, there's that little grab, but these, you know, they're nice little color grab, but like I said, these winds are relatively weak. Let's go see what happened this time. If you actually look at a nice analysis, surface analysis here, you kind of see what was going on and what helped. Once again, what do we see here? Boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. Nice warm front extension east west across the state, dry line right here, storms formed up here. You got a nice little fade E axis feeding into this, and that's when the show began. The visit imagery pretty much tells the story here. Here's, uh, I believe, the tornado we said occurred to start around 21 Z ish. You know, a nice little fine line here. Right? Not, not a fine line, excuse me. Nice little line of convergence here, it's indivisible. Note with time 20 Z, 21 Z, 22 Z, 23 Z, pushing to almost 24 Z. Storms anchored on that boundary. Quite a few tornadoes develop that. There's another thing that we find out here. You got these boundaries. Storms sit on the boundaries, they are anchored, and uh, we can get some interesting, very interesting things to occur. Uh, many of the tornadoes were uh, land spouts with this day, um, but transition towards warm supercell tornadoes later on in the afternoon as the shear got better. Uh, I'd like to say most of the data came from this study here. All right, let's look at one more. The third case of the big days, the Southeast Carolina, this is 22 April. There's the tornado tracks that occurred this day. So, um, uh, for reference, there's Lamar right there. The hunt is back here. The, um, Burlington is up here. We're sitting up somewhere up here. And we had this long uh, cyclic uh, supercell producing all these tornadoes at the time. So, now, first thing you can probably just look at that imagery and say, well, um, the LCLs were not an issue this day. Here's a, this is a case where there's a big synoptic uh, cutoff flow moving slowly east with time. Uh, there's a 500 millibar truck that morning. Here's a profile from Denver. Obviously, it's quite moist, but actually, got farther east. It's likely a little bit drier here, a lot more favorable. Um, moving on here, this is SPC data from this case, 20Z. We have the uh, service based cape here, so you the AE axis feed right into that. We've got the storms forming over the Mesa, higher terrain, plenty of deep shear, and there's your temperature uh, off, the, off the rough model. Because I didn't have any good surface data with this, and I apologize for this. But so you kind of see your thin next day, the axis feed right up in here. Um, however, I do know that the temperature dew point in Lahana uh, just west of the first tornado was 868 or 55. And that's, you know, this time of year, not surprising because like, so this is an April case. The dry line was also in the region from when I read the AFDs and the MCDs. City. Classic early springtime caves, lots of shear, lots of cave. However, one thing I want to discuss with this case is I don't know how many times I've heard this, it just irks the heck out of me as a forecaster. Oh, the flow is burning on, oh, nothing's going to happen. That's a bunch of B U L L S, bleep, 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 bleep. That's, 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 not, that's not true. You got to really look carefully at the low levels and what's going on. 
Once again, you gotta look at that hodograph, you gotta look at that low level shear. In this case, a classic example, SPC did fairly good on this day, but you know, they, they, in, their, in their discussions, you know, they, they were highlighting everything going to happen down here, all the big, big events. And you know, there were significant, significant tornadoes down here, but yeah, there was a long lived tornadic supercell that moved pretty much up from extreme southeast Colorado up in the uh, east, northeast of Colorado on that day. So you can get good things occur. It was kind of interesting. A lot of chairs blew off this storm and went to Kansas. They did see tornadoes there. But they, you know, they could stay with this storm here and they could have had a host fest for hours on it. So just you know, once again, make sure you look at your, your cape analysis and look at look at what's going on, look at those photographs and feel for what's going on. Just because it's cold doesn't mean things can't happen. And like I said, Mariana Flow, don't, don't buy into that argument, oh Mariana Flow can't do it. Well, it, it can. Now let's look at a few more cases. Ah oh, the Memorial, I'll spike that. I'll pronounce that one easy. Memorial Day, we were, I was actually working this event, unfortunately. I was, at the, I was at the public office. This was in our county warning area. And we, were, we were using uh, uh, information about warnings that we never used before. Usually, years ago, you know, old weather service, you know, national weather service, top of radar, syndicating strong rotation, tornado, blah, blah. Well, you know, this was a time when we were, still, we were starting to get live feeds in from you guys. And we were actually putting in our warnings. That, Live storm feeds from chasers in Baca County are indicating a large and violent tornado occurred. Well, I don't know if it's these large and violent, a very large tornado occurred. Well, I'd say that's pretty large. And we, we used that text for, we used that text information for the first time. And people took notice. And, and, and from now, now on, we're not, a, we're not concerned about mentioning what chasers are actually seeing. It's, it's your, the information that you supply us, especially if it's in real time, really, really is helpful. Tell you as a forecast, I'm very grateful for it. I chase and and forecast, so I see both sides of it. I don't know how many times Roger Hill has verified our warnings, and then I'm just talking about not necessarily in real time, but just let us know what happened earlier that day. It's really important that we know it. It really helps for verification. I mean, the tornado database is only as good as we that the information that goes into it. So it's important that we get the information. So let's get back get back to this case. Um, once again, uh, you just look at the 500 millibar chart that day, really not all that much going on. Zonal flow, a couple of weak ripples coming in. However, temperatures are loft. That's not too shabby, negative 13, negative 14. Cold air, once again, in mid-levels. There's your sounding. Uh, once again, look at those winds. You know, that doesn't, first look at that, that will tell you that this is going to be a big day. And here's also, um, I believe, from Dodge City, that's his Amarillo. Once again, relatively weak. The holograph's a little bit better here, but still weak winds. Okay, once again, an analysis by Monteverdi and others did a really good job on this case. We kind of see what was going on. Once again, here's your boundary, your higher terrain. There was this anomalously cold pocket of air, and, and, and the authors of the study really couldn't figure out what was causing it, but still, it kind of set up a nice little barrel clipping zone for these storms to develop on. We also know from the, 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 uh, from the ruck analysis that the photographs got better with time as the afternoon progressed. You can see that's a, that's a pretty healthy photograph. A photograph there, not a photograph. Um, and once again, our analysis from Cape Fields coming across to the 30 e axis feeding into the boundary, shears improving, and we all know what happened. And once again, similar to the storms that I've shown here, um, there's what? There's 17Z all the way out to 15Z, so I've got six, six, seven hours. There's initiation of the storm. How many miles did that storm move in that six, seven hours? Not much. Seems like it's kind of anchored to something there. Maybe the terrain, the boundary, but once again, people who were on this day, people who saw this tornado, was, um, they, had a, they had a very, very good day to say the least. Ellicott tornado, 28 May 2001, we had six tornadoes occur in El Paso County, the day just east of Colorado Springs. Two are F2, they were all supercells. Very few chances I've done this event. Well, the reason why that is, and I'll show you. And once again, not surprising, 500 millibar chart, another, another week, 12 coming through. Winds were a little bit stronger, it's the 0Z, 29 days, a little bit later. This day, uh, Late afternoon when these tornadoes occur, so that's a little jet streak coming across. We kind of see here the DCBZ was lit up very well here, you can obviously see that. And it kind of extended, it was 
Connect is going to be converted to boundary down this way. I'll show you that with the radar data. Uh, we had good stout southeast flow, good dew points. Well, look at those temperatures, 66 over 54. Really not all that exciting if you first look at that, saying, oh, there's going to be significant tornado activity in this area. First tornado occurred at 130Z. Um, there's your convergence set up. There's, there's uh, El Paso County, Colorado Springs. We're up here somewhere. Lyman is right there to be referenced. Boundary sitting right here. People, <coughs> sorry. And the first one. <laughs> First tornado occurred out like I said, 130Z, so let me see here. There's the sand that I showed earlier. Uh, plenty of cake was sufficient, shear was sufficient. I'll show you. This is the actual Denver sounding, but if you actually look at the KPUX bad wind profile, and you put that into this sounding, this is what actually what, what occurred that day. And we kind of see that the shear is, and you can want to recognize that that's some pretty impressive shear values. Now, I'll also be the first to admit that I tend to think our uh, bat profiles of the radar are a little high, but still, you know, given that cake that we know from the sounding and the shear and the boundary sitting out there, that uh, good things can occur, even if you have temperatures in the mid 60s and dew points in the 50s. Lyman, Colorado, 1990, six, nine tornadoes this day, F3, this is F3 that went right through Lyman. That's some really old new book goodie stuff I took for monthly weather review, weather forecasting AMS 1994. Give credit where credit's due. But still, once again, you know, not all that exciting. 500 millibar, uh, 500 millibar chart, negative 11. When's, you know, 30 knots, yeah, not all that great, but boy, what's, what's happened here? Boy, looks like, just like the Doswell picture that I showed earlier. And your day two funnel system came through, set the upslope up, upslope up in this case, not upslope. There's a 12Z analysis. You kind of see the good dew points, 59, 59, 54 in Lyman. I'll tell you one thing. You ever see 30, 40 knots in Lyman at 500? You see a flag higher up at 60 dew point? You should do anything or anything you possibly can do to be in Lyman and watch the show. Because I guarantee you, I don't think I've seen a day where we've had those conditions and not good things, really good things have hurt. It's just, I, I, I dream for those days of 62 months, come on, come on. And also, I'm off, so I can change. The good news is my, my, my wife is really, I found it very important, it's very good to have a spouse understand your crazy habits. And she does. And, uh, you know, there'll be those days where, you know, you got some family thing to do, but you know it's a really good day. So please, and, okay, we just don't think that. Off the line, and I had this here, but she said, I said, it's got to Moving on, sounding, uh, this was uh, Denver sounding 12Z that morning. Uh, low levels, of, once again, I, I, I need to emphasize the winds. The winds here and your thermal obviously is not representative of what's going to happen in mining. But we already know from that surface chart, that there's very good southeasterlies and moisture in there. And just imagine, you, just put that, those temperatures and dew points into this sounding and the wind into this sounding, and it doesn't take much to know that, hey, it's going to be a good day. You know, you're going to, you know, it's just giving that gosh, it's going these are the things you dream for. And once again, putting that information into this, I didn't put the winds in, obviously, but I put the temperature dew point from Lyman into the sounding, and you, know, you can see your cape up there, it's 1550, and you get like I said, give it those southeasterly winds, and you know, these stout westerly winds aloft, and there's your flags. Um, that's a pretty impressive sounding. Now, more importantly with this day, we already had the front go through, we already talked about day two, but once again, Mr. MCS in Western Kansas will really made this day spectacular. There's the, there's the boundary from the entity. The culprit already got through, so you already got the upslope up occurring. But here's an MC, a boundary associated with an MCS that came through and is heading towards Lyman. Now, the DCDZ was set up too, which is it's a weak convection. What actually happened this day is this thunderstorm intensified, put out a, put out a boundary, interacted with this. And that's what really got the show occurring. And here's, here's, here's the outflow boundary from the MCS from 94. Here's your day two cold front. 
Make sure your moisture is coming, good moisture coming in, your higher terrain, so we all know what happened. Another lineman day, 2004, 10 May 2004. I could have kicked myself in the butt this day because I could have easily chased, but I, I, I made the famous mistake of, oh, the winds are too weak, I'm off. It's, it's just, well, if something goes, it'll be an HP. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, boy, now this is the day that Roger Hill, um, your wife, I believe, went out and saw just some spectacular, you know. Good job. You made the same mistake I did. I'm very, very pretty for you. a bunch of all of them were. Except for like the first one was rain wrapped, all the rest of them are just spectacular photographic events. And here's, here's a beautiful example. I got some terrain here. You see the storm form with the higher terrain in the east. Move north east. And once again, what's our best friend? There it is. MCS the night before in Kansas. Here, well, here I apologize, it's not, not the best uh, image here. Uh, Colorado is right here. Once again, there's your wheat trough coming across. You follow that umbrella boat, where is that? Oh, these are, I think, I, oh, let's see. Oh, yeah, there are 500 mile bar winds here primarily. They're 20, 20, 20, 30 knots, you know, eh, not too exciting. You've got some surface winds also, I'm sure you can't see them, I apologize. After, they're from South East, but it's for 18Z on that day, so. There's your wheat trough, your MCS boundary coming across, all these good things coming together. And here's a beautiful example of it. There's the out, there's the, Low clouds and moisture coming across. Here's your outflow boundary moving towards the west. Storm initiates off the high terrain, interacts with the boundary. We all know what kind of happened here. Really good stuff occurred. And I just I apologize, this is old data and I couldn't I couldn't redo this. But you can see the dew points just increase with time. And yet if you see the dew points increase in time and it's and it's clear in south in the eastern plains, you know that's good news. Usually there's always some mixing. Well in this case, the moisture was even going up. So this storm was the show. I don't know if it was the show. I got one more. There's, there's the sounding from all uh, the And uh, you can see how that outflow boundary really enhanced the low level shear there. I mean, you know, you know, there's no flies in there, but boy, they just really got us act together. Really good day. F3 in Daly, Logan County. Some of you are probably familiar with this photograph. It's on that one of the AMS. Severe weather folks that they had. However, this is a much better shot. Uh, Ian Whitmire was out this day. They put a mine up and was in Fort Collins. Boy, that's a spectacular story. I don't know if you ever saw the tornado, but the tornado actually occurred at nighttime. This is a, um, I don't got any slides with this, but this is just stout southwesterly flow. Very dry, very hot. However, the boundary was up here in northeast Colorado, 70 dew point. Up here in uh, North Platte, Sydney was 61. You had this fade E axis feeding right into the higher terrain of the Cheyenne Ridge. The cap broke, and then, like I said, we all know what happened. Here's the actual sounding from Denver. I actually put in the Sydney observation, surface observation. I had to put in the winds, but there's a lot of serious cake there. Uh, almost 4,000 pounds per kilogram of courage on the Cheyenne Ridge. And, uh, good things about this. Except for October 11, 1997, the six supercell tornadoes across southeast Colorado. I don't have too much data over here. But this is one of the few Denver soundings that I know of that had a wind profile that in the morning that was stable for supercell storms. It's, it's rare if you've ever seen this. I mean, I've only seen it looking back at the archives because I've only seen it twice. And here's the holograph associated with this. Because I don't have much information for this day. But like I said, you already had that going in the morning. Reason why that occurred once again, springtime or this it wasn't spring, it was a late season, deep latitude 12 moving slowly east with time. Now the golf course should come up and all had broke loose. And June 1965, um, this was what like one of the biggest multi day severe weather events in the state of God in history. It was known, it was known for all the flash flooding that occurred, which would be a problem because the flash flooding day was devastating across the uh, high plains. I mean, it, it, the flash flooding that occurred this day is the reason why Chatfield Reservoir was built and also Pueblo Reservoir Dam was built. It's because of the horrific flash flooding that occurred. And if that were ever to occur today, well, if it were to occur today, it wouldn't be too bad for Denver because we have the big dams sitting just south of here. 
but uh, everything casts a lot. I mean, reading these reports here, um, the assessment and everything, it was just amazing what happened. It was, the, the, the water flowing in small streams and the water flowed, flows down the Mississippi River. Um, it was just, yeah, it's real, I don't think you'd really be able to change it. It was just that bad. And we all know, unfortunately, one day it's probably going to happen again. There were like, yeah, there were dozens, there were, there were dozens of tornadoes reported, but yeah, back then they didn't report tornadoes. Like they do now. I can not imagine how many supercells of tornadoes have occurred. Getting, especially given the tracks that you see in this little bit here. And as a kid, you know, going down the line, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Boy, very, very impressive. Uh, meteorology, I'm just going to quick review here. Uh, let me see if this is going to work. Uh, there we go, they're automatically. There's your trough, very slow moving, deep, deep trough, deep, not a, not a tune on the scale of it. Play that again, or can you click on the little red arrow there? If you can, if you can, it's no big deal. I guess it's a nice slow moving trough. Meridian will flow for days on end. So we'll move on here. Ah, oh, there's some surface troughs on the one by one. Let's note the dew points here. Note the winds. Day after day after day after day after day. Uh, you were solidly in the 50s and the 60s. And I guess like day in and day out, day in and day out. It's wild, wild, wild things. Some uh, soundings that were recreated, I apologize. I, I don't know if you can see them all that well. But here's uh, one cyclic supercell forming just north of uh, Colorado Springs, coming across Castle Rock, coming from southeast Denver, east to Denver. Can you imagine a cyclic supercell of this nature occurring? Uh, in this day and age, the damage would be. I guess I did this, there's a sound here, we kind of stopped to hmm? see all the cake values here. We were uh, <laughs> yeah. literally in the thousands here with the caves. Uh, Fort Collins area on the 15th, uh, cave here was 2800 joules. Tornado occurred west, just west, five miles west of Lublin, large hill in town, west of town. Um, Pueblo, 4,400 joules per kilogram of cave on uh, 18Z. The tornado was a cell not on this day. And we got one more event to talk about. This was um, a winter storm that occurred. These were all the tornadoes that occurred on the 44th April 2007. We had them in total. Uh, once again, the area that we're talking about, Lyman is up in here. Here's uh, Cheyenne Wells. <coughs> Burlington's up here. Mars right down here. So, and to kind of get a feel for the area you're talking about. This was a really interesting day. In fact, besides the fact that it was snowing like heck on the palm of the um, There is the storm, uh, 500 millibar chart right here, 500 millibar cutoff flow right moving across uh, eastern Colorado. Here's the surface depiction. And here's the barrier, here's the occlusion here. And here's where all the tornadoes are coming right here. Both these temperatures and dew points, the heavy snow being recorded up here. And it's in fact occurring on with this. There's here. Note the snow reports in the observations here. Snow like crazy on the Palmer Divide. There's the occlusion and all these little mini supercells and tornadoes occurring. Now the temperature dew points here, 55 over 49, 50 over 47, you know, some 59 over 40, so there was just enough cake and a tremendous shield when you see that. Here's, a, here's an example of what's going on. Uh, this is a cross section from this little supercell storm here. That's 25,000 feet max. Still, nonetheless, nice bounding big gecko meeting with it. Nice overhang, nice uh, mesocyclone associated with it. This storm produced two tornadoes. All that fact, all the tornadoes, all the little mini supercells are forming along that line for tornado. And here's an example, once again, tremendous shear, just enough cape. This was the area of Cheyenne Wells. So just like I said, low level shear just really plays a role. If you get the strong low level shear and sufficient cave, things can go. And these are some SPC charts. I believe these, uh, these values are realistic, but they're maybe a little bit too far more to look why that is. But like I said, you have your great 0.1 kilometer shear, 3 kilometer shear. 
in this case, three kilometers straight was deep shear. <laughs> and then in your fading e axis of thousand moles per kilogram fading into this, that was enough to get things going. So with that, I'll end. Um, obviously, I think with all the case examples I showed, uh, boundaries tend to play a key role to radio genesis on the high plains. Well, to be honest with you, boundaries tend to play important role with all tornadoes everywhere. But in this case, they, they really tend to help anchor storms and really uh, can get things going. Outflow boundaries, uh, especially with your MCS and what you can, is really critically important in supplying good low-level juice to, to the storms, you know, plus the boundary interactions. Um, quite a few cases show deep shear is not always obvious for the for good supercell storms to develop. The mid-lower levels can be relatively weak, but we still, as I showed with all these cases, we still can get great storms. Some events start off as non-supercell tornadoes and transition to supercell and turn out events. Um, storms can go relatively early. If you wait for 6 o'clock magic, you are going to miss the train, at least most of the time. Lower levels play a significant role in tornado genesis. Obviously, you know that. Um, temperatures and dew forms are generally can be quite a bit lower than your classic southern plain events. So that makes you also want to add, you know, keep an eye on, don't get hung up on that Mariana flow stuff. Be careful, make sure you really look at your soundings. You know, don't worry about the temperature. Dew ports are relatively low. Look at your K profiles. Also, another thing, a lot of things that I showed today, I don't know if your, your models, especially your, you know, your NAM and GFS are really going to show. You know, you're not going to see where those boundaries are on the, on the model guides. You know, you really got to be careful and look at your data that morning and see what's going on and, and, and pretty much go from there. Otherwise, uh, that's it. As I mentioned earlier, uh, don't forget that the national listeners know when you see two things. Uh, Real-time info obviously is best, but the maybe reports can help with the application. And with that, I don't know what the time is. I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you. Uh, Yeah, it's going to be tremendous if they can get this part of the out. Okay, number two. 